Good morning, good morning again. If you're joining us for the first time or if you have uh, continued on with us from our worship service this morning, uh, we're going into our men's Bible, our men's Sunday school uh, portion, and we're continuing, um, we're finishing um, the second part of a two-part um, series of Sunday School lessons, and uh, we're going to be in the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 16, and uh, last week we went over verses 1 through 8, and this week we will finish off with 9 through 13, Luke, chapter 16, and we'll be in verses 9 through 13 this week. <clears throat> but just by way of review and reminder, about last week the um, accounting scandal that's found here in the parable of the unjust steward. And last week we talked about um, the message of the scandal and how Jesus used this earthly story with a heavenly meaning to communicate with his disciples. And if you'll go ahead and pick up in, in verse 8, just to back up just a little bit, where we left off last week, is that the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly and so we found out last week that the steward had planned ahead. The steward used available resources to secure his future and that uh, this was a profitable lesson even though it came from a poor example. So from the message of the scandal, Jesus will follow up his parable with three mandates, and that's what we're going to discuss today to complete um, our examination of this parable. And so there are three mandates of the Savior that Jesus gives after he has related the parable to his disciples. So I'll read just for context, and then we'll get into the lesson. Amen? Amen. So... Luke chapter 16, and I'll read from uh, verse 9 through verse 13. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? Verse 13, no servant can serve two masters, for either we, he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. For the time that we have together, let us meditate on the three mandates of the Savior, three mandates of the Savior. So first, if we back up just a little bit to the B clause of verse 8, we see that Jesus declares that the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And then he goes on to say, I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when you fail, they may receive you, the old King James would say, into everlasting habitations. I like that. Everlasting habitations. New 
King James just says, very simply, very plainly, into an everlasting home. What does this mean? So worldly people may appear to be more shrewd or more wise with worldly matters than spiritual people are in spiritual matters. Have you ever met someone that just, it just seems like they just have their life together? I mean, they have a good job, they have their finances in order. It appears that they are wise. But what Jesus is saying is that the children of this world are in their generation. So in this life, it appears that worldly people are wiser than the children of light are in spiritual matters. So we should not have someone that, that um, in, 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 in our Christian walk, we should not be people that take more care with our physical resources in this generation, in our lifetime. That's what he's talking about. In our lifetime, we should not be more concerned with our financial portfolio than with our faith portfolio. It's not to say that we shouldn't be concerned with what's going on in the stock market if we're invested there or what's going on in a business that we've started or what's going on with the company that we work for. Jesus is not saying that we should not care about the things of this world because this is our living. However, we should be even more attuned and even more concerned with spiritual matters and that also, by the same token, we should be good stewards and use our wealth, and this could be in our wealth of knowledge, our wealth of skills, or our wealth of abilities for kingdom building. Yes, so the way, it's, it's, it's number one, have a proper view of the resources that you have. Yes. We shouldn't be more concerned about earthly things than heavenly things, not to not be concerned with them at all, but we should at least be concerned with our uh, everlasting habitations than where we're going to retire physically. That home that you want to buy, where you're going to retire in a certain place at a certain time, you plan for it. I mean, you are making sure that your 401k has the right contributions and you talk to your financial advisor every quarter and you watch those things and you know if you made money, if you lost money, we closely. But how closely are we watching our relationship with God? How closely are we watching the, our relationship with with other believers, and how are we watching our relationship with those that are non-believers and presenting Christ to them on an ongoing basis? And you see, he, he also goes on to instruct us as far as the use of our resources because he tells us that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. Yes. Now, we make friends by our investment in God's word, and in God's people. Those are the only two things that last forever. Wow. So if you're looking for the best return on investment, mm. if you're looking for the best buy and hold position, that is to make an investment in God's word and the souls of men because those are the only two things that last forever. How do I know that? Look at Matthew 5 and 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Meaning that there is not the dot above the I or the cross that, that, that crosses a T that will pass away from the word of God until it is fulfilled. That means that we have the word of God forever. Wow. And also on the same token, in that same gospel according to Matthew, look at, uh, uh, chapter 25, and you can look at verses 34, 41, and 46. It says, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you for the foundation of the world. 
Verse 41, then shall he say unto them on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And verse 46, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. So either way, whether you're a believer in Christ or not, you will live forever. The question is where will you live forever? forever but regardless we see that the word of God and the souls of men are both eternal and if they are eternal since they are eternal they are worthy of the most consideration everything else that Jesus is talking about is temporary this money is temporary if you look at your dollar bill ten dollar bill twenty dollar bill whichever bill take it out look at it When you look at it, the reason for its value is printed on it. It says, uh, nowadays, since the United States has gotten off the gold standard, your money used to be backed by gold, locked away. But there was a change, and it changed to where there was no longer gold that backed up the value of the dollar. If you look at your dollar, it'll say it's backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. Your money is only worth what it's worth as long as people believe that it's worth what the government says it's worth. If anything were to ever happen to the United States government, all those dollars that you spent all that time for are not even worth the paper that they're printed on. Because the value is not associated with anything tangible anymore. It is associated with something intangible, which is the full faith and credit of the United States government. That's why even when you had currency in the form of precious metals, it could still be stolen. It could rust. Uh, and that's where we get the verse where it says where, where rust or moth does not destroy. And so the money that we have, we have to understand that it is currency. And so that only helps us for what is current. See? It doesn't help us for what is eternal. So we have friends made on earth by investing our resources and the friends that we have made by investing our resources on earth, they will receive us into heaven. The people that you've invested in spiritually, they, those that have gone before us to be with the Lord, they will receive us They will receive us. So I believe that when you come into heaven, there's a a parade to receive you. Of all the people that you invested in. And I don't know about you, but I want there to be several in attendance. (laughs) I don't want there to be, you know, show up for, you know, one of those things where it's just one flyer here and one, you know. There's got to be something that we use our current resources for that will bring eternal returns. So that's the first mandate, is that Jesus wants us to pay attention to our resources that we have currently on the earth and be shrewd like the children of this world, but we should be just as shrewd in our spiritual matters since we are children of the light. We see the second mandate in verse 10 through 12. It says, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And that he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, Who shall give you that which is your own? So if we are not faithful in light of Jesus' life and resurrection, 
why would God give us our own life and resurrection? If we are given this life and the gospel is presented to us of Jesus' life and resurrection and we deny and discard the truth of the gospel, why would God give us our own life and resurrection? We have to be faithful in that which is least. And so we see this in many different areas as we teach children We give them small tasks and allow them to demonstrate faithfulness. And as they grow up, we give them increasingly more important tasks. This is a part of maturation. This is a part of growing up. Same thing on your job. When you start out, you don't start out usually as the chief executive officer. You start out at the entry-level position. And as you're faithful in that entry-level position, then you're offered the opportunity to be promoted and handle greater and greater tasks of responsibility to the company. So if that's the case in raising children and if that's the case in training employees, why would you think that it would be any different in the spiritual sense? Look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 to 21. For if our citizenship is in heaven from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has given even to subject all things to himself. So we've got to ask a question is, where are we living for? Now, that sounds weird because normally you would say, who or what are we living for? But I would submit to you, where are we living for? Are we living for our citizenship in the United States of America or the state of Texas or the city of Houston? Or are we living in light of our citizenship being in heaven? So as believers, we have dual citizenship. So I have, a, I have a colleague at work that has dual citizenship. She has citizenship in France, and she has citizenship in the United States. Okay? And so she's from France, and she uh, plans on retiring to France, but she lives right now in the United States in the same way. We come from another jurisdiction we come from a heavenly realm but we live here now but as part of the believers retirement plan we will go back and resume living in heaven but for right now we have this dual citizenship because even though we live in the the earthly community and the earthly realm, we abide by the values and rules of our true home where our citizenship is in heaven. But while we're here, the, 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 Paul tells the Philippian church what to do, that we should eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is saying here in Luke, he's, he's saying that You need to be faithful in the small things before you can be entrusted with the greater things. Because if we can't handle a few dollars, how are we going to have the true riches entrusted to us? So, again, he says, if you have been faithful in, in, in little, then you'll be faithful in much, but also the same thing. If you're unjust in little, you'll be unjust in much. Right. So the issue is not you needing greater responsibility or you needing greater resources. It's you being faithful with your current responsibility and your current resources. And then at the appointed time, then you'll be entrusted with greater, but A lot of times, especially in our social media culture, everything is focused on getting more, better, faster now. Right now. You want a microwaved 
blessing. However, that's just not how natural systems work. When you plant in the fall, or when you plant in the spring and you reap in the fall, you cannot shortcut that process. There's no way, it's not the same as like a test. In school, we take a test and you can, you can slack off and not go to class and then you can try to cram for the test. That is a value system, okay? The value is the grade you get. And you can shortcut a value system. But a natural system, you can't. You can't wait till halfway through the growing season and then try to plant and expect a harvest at the same time. It will never happen. And God works based on natural and supernatural systems, not on the value. It's not about making a particular grade. It's about being faithful with what you've been given now. So the second mandate is that we have to be faithful. Um, so first mandate is that we need to be faithful with the, the friends we've made on earth by investing our resources. Um, and we'll see that return in heaven. Then the second mandate, mandate is to be faithful uh, with what we have now, and we should do so in light of Jesus' faithfulness to us. But then there's a third mandate. The third mandate is found in verse 13. And it says, No servant can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So mammon was a, a term that was used to describe a particular uh, God at the time, lowercase g, that uh, referred to resources, fruitfulness, money. It just became another word for money. Yeah. Just like we say, hey, uh, let me get some bread or you know, whatever the case may be, we're, refer we're using a euphemism, we're referring to the currency of the day, playing term. And so that's what Jesus is, is getting across, that no servant can serve two masters. I don't know if you've ever been in that position where you had two bosses that told you to do two completely opposite things. That's one of the most stressful situations when it's like, well, this guy told me to do this thing, and this guy told me to do another thing. And often we get ourselves in that situation uh, by subjecting ourselves to uh, an inaccurate view of how we ought to live. And so I, I see this, these, these things on Facebook and Instagram where they'll have uh, someone that, that is, is pictured, and then on one side there's a little angel and then on the other side, there is a little devil. And so uh, that's to give the idea that we, as men, uh, are influenced how we behave by light and by darkness. And that there is some guardian angel and there is some tormenting spirit. And they duke it out for... Uh, who's going to win the day? Who's going to influence this person the most? Whereas, uh, not to negate the reality of, of spiritual warfare, but that decision as far as how you behave is not coming from the angel on the shoulder or the devil on the other shoulder. It's not coming from the top down as far as them influencing you. If you, are the, if you are a believer, the good news is that it works from inside out yes, sir. Yes, sir. instead of top down because you should be indwelt by the Holy Spirit and from the Holy Spirit should emanate and outpour how you ought to live. Yes, sir. And by the, the comforter leading you into understanding all things by your study of his word, you will know how you should act. So there should never be a position where we should try to serve two masters. And that's the issue, is that in the past and even now, you know, because uh, the new age philosophy is built on old lie. And so uh, people still thinking that there's no objective reality and that there's no word from God and that if it feels right, do it, and uh, all these different things that don't take into account that there is an objective truth. There is an objective reality, and it is revealed in 
the scriptures is it is revealed in the Holy Bible, and we don't have to wonder who our master is because he is revealed as the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our master teacher. So we have to be very careful not to put ourselves in a position where we feel like we're serving to masters. And what happens is this. If you find yourself in that position, you'll either hate the one or love the other. So that gives you over to swings between excessives in one direction or the other. This is what happens where people are described as manic depressives. Manic depressives. They have uh, uh, times that they're in mania, which is they are excited and they are happy, but to uh, a, a degree that is unhealthy, and they usually take risks that they shouldn't take. And then you have the depressive period, and this is within the same person, the same life. It's a, it's a condition that can be very destructive. And in the depressive times, it is the complete opposite. The person is, is uh, reclusive. The person is antisocial. The person is, is, is destructive in another way. Wow. And so in order to keep us from being either in mania or in being dep in depression, we have to make sure that we're not split between trying to serve two masters. We can't be trying to serve uh, uh, the God of mammon in not having a work-life balance because if we go too far on one side, everything is about work, everything is about making money, but then at home you have a wife and children that are neglected. But then on the other side, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands, and poverty will come upon you. <laughs> the word tells us. And so if it's the other side, well, you know, I don't really want to work hard because I want to have time with my family. Well, then you won't have resources to provide for them. So in order to, to, to have a balanced view, there has to be a view that Jesus Christ is my master. And if I don't work, I don't eat. But also at the same time, I have a responsibility to keep a balance and take care of my wife and children. So there has to be balance. The problem is, is that we end up trying to serve two masters at the same time, and we are out of balance. But if we just serve one master, we remain in balance, and we serve Christ as he would have us to. And so he also says, um, you cannot serve God and mammon. It's impossible. So the, th the thing is that it's not worth trying <laughs> because you cannot do it. You're going to land one way or the other. And you may not be all the way 100% to an extreme one way or 100% to the other extreme somewhere else, but you're not going to be even down the middle. You're going to be leaning one way or leaning the other way because you're trying to please these different masters and, and literally you're, you're spinning plates. If you've ever seen that at the circus, you're literally spinning plates. And so there's a balanced approach that is available. And so if we look at um, just a few things in terms of Joshua 24 and 15, we're encouraged. And if it seem evil to you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So there is a, a commitment that has to happen, especially as men, that as for us and our houses, we will serve the Lord. And we're not going to vacillate in between two opinions, but we're going to serve the Lord. And Luke 9 and 23 also encourages us, and he said to them all, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And so we talked about that this morning when uh, Jesus was uh, confronting uh, Peter and he encouraged him to follow him, that Jesus encouraged Peter to follow him. So there has to be one master that's set uh, above all of our affairs in order for us to have that balanced life. So here's, here the message of the scandal. The scandal of the unrighteous steward is that he was not more severely punished. 
the rich man could have been well within his rights to disgrace the steward and could have put him in jail for his wastefulness. However, the rich man had mercy on the steward just like God has mercy on us. Just as the steward, our unrighteousness deserves a more severe punishment than we get. So not only hear the message of the scandal that we talked about last week, but heed the mandates of the Savior this week. Use earthly resources for kingdom building. Be faithful to receive the true riches and then serve God only. Serve God only as your master. Obviously, we serve each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, but in terms of uh, having a master, there can only be one, and we should be serving our master teacher, the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we've, we've talked about things in a financial sense, I, I ask you not only to hear and to heed, but I also implore you to hurry. Hurry to declare bankruptcy before God right now. File a chapter 11 reorganization of your life. We are debtors in possession of our life and resources. I had a, a time that I was part of a company that did declare chapter 11. And what happened is they appointed a trustee over the affairs during the reorganization period. And when I would get my paycheck, it would no longer just say the company name, but it would say the company name, debtor in possession, which meant that even though the company uh, uh, had the rich, had the riches, had the 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 uh, resources, had the property that we had the same way we had the first time, but we were debtors. We owed more than what that property was worth, and so even though we possessed it, we were still in debt. And there was a trustee appointed over us that told us how we needed to use the resources of the company. And so we are debtors in possession of our lives and resources. Even though you may physically have it in your hand, possession is not the same as ownership. Yeah. Ask someone that, sold, that, that, has, that has ever stolen anything. Yeah. They have it in their hand. Yeah. They possess it, but they don't own it. And so we've got to understand that that we lives and resources, but bought a price that we cannot do it on our own. We are in need of a savior. Yeah. We are in need of a savior, and Jesus is our trustee. He is the one that can tell us how to best use our life and how to best use our resources for our good and his glory. So I would encourage to trust in Christ one for salvation if you have not met our risen Savior Jesus Christ but also and so well, a lot of times we focus on salvation which before a holy God and then also glorification which is when we get our glorified bodies in heaven but sometimes we neglect that middle tense of our salvation which is sanctification which is in the meantime how we live. Trust in Jesus also for your sanctification. How you ought to live here in this life. And so we can always, uh, for a refresher, uh, to take a look at how this is done. Look at Ephesians 2 and 1 through 9, and we'll end on this note. Uh, Ephesians 2, 1 through 9, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and power of the air, that the spirit now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we had our conversation in times past in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the, the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, even as others. Even as others. But here we go. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, 
He hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace we are saved and had ra and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places with Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace we are saved through faith and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So again, we've all been in a situation where, you know, it was, uh, our walk was different because of uh, influences in our life and our conversations in the past revolved around the lust of the flesh or, or fulfilling the desires of the flesh or even fulfilling the desires of our mind. Yeah. And we were children of wrath, but the believer in Christ is saved from the wrath of God because the believer is declared righteous because of their belief. So again, the three mandates of the Savior give us an idea as how we should steward our resources. And I hope that this has been a profitable lesson uh, that Jesus has given from a poor example. Um, let's go ahead and open up the conference for questions, comments, concerns, questions or comments. We have people on the Zoom conference. We have people on our regular conference call. Amen. All right. So we'll go ahead and, and uh, wrap up our men's Sunday school lesson right here. And again, um, you know, we'll all, we'll, we'll, if the Lord says the same, we'll have the opportunity to talk about this again at another time. Um, if there's any questions or comments, they can definitely be directed. Um, either, oh, hold on, here we go. Say it one more time. Yes. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, we can hear you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I guess this, me going back over it uh, and looking back in the past week, when you before you coming back to continue this lesson, I guess when I looked at verse, kind of to add to the context, uh, Sean, when it kind of helped me, I looked at verse 14 and 15 in the, uh, that you reached out basically at 13, but 14 and 15, which, you know, I guess in every every aspect of Jesus' teaching, he always was had a purpose in whom he was, when he was speaking, even when he was trying to instruct his disciples. And it just says here, and I'm reading from the NIV. I'm using the NIV this morning. Uh, verse 14 says, the Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. And he said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your heart. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. Wow. Mm -hmm. And under, understanding, wow. and now I guess it made it a little clear, even though Jesus gives the parable, but Jesus also knowing that there were those that was in that, audience I would say that that uh that love money, you know, which is an example I guess for us as understanding, you know, that and you make you brought that out well that I we shouldn't have a love for money, but we should utilize our resources in a way that uh would help advance the kingdom of, of God and have eternal value attached to it and not just for our own selfish uh selfish good. Mm -hmm. And and uh then some of the things that that seemed highly with me, because you had those that thought as Pharisees that if 
Well, well, we we kind of I guess to kind of bring that home. Sometimes we even out of religion in the church, we think that if I got more than somebody else, then I'm more blessed than them, and I should be looked at favored more. But that's not how God looks at people. He actually knows us from the inside out. So that don't make me make you no better than me or me no better than you because of monetary things. Mm -hmm. But even I think back, even in Jesus' time, they had dealt with that. So surely today. We we still face that same crisis, even within the uh, within the church. So that's just something I kind of looked at uh, uh, myself in, in going back over this lesson before you coming to today, Sean. But it was just something that kind of stood out to me in my observation, because uh, then that kind of helped me. But I was wondering at first when Jesus kind of goes into this and gives this about money, but then when it helped me when I looked and said, "Wow, okay, he had some folks standing there that was observing it, but they were." Levels of money, yeah. mm -hmm. so he was on point by what he was saying. If that, if that makes sense, what I'm saying. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, good observation. And one one thing I would one thing I would just add to that is um, if you look at verse one. I know we looked at this last week, but if you look at verse one, it says he also said to his disciples. So, he, so Jesus was having a private conversation. Okay, but I want you to see something. Verse 1, it says, he said to his disciples, and then verse 14, it says, now the Pharisees who were lovers of money also heard these things. There's always someone listening. Always someone listening. So even though Jesus has, 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 is speaking aside, okay, uh, he's speaking privately to his disciples, but you see that the Pharisees, and it describes them as lovers of money, heard all these things, and they, in the New King James, they derided him. Because obviously they could not receive this word because uh, it hit at the heart of their own desire. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Still a continuation. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right. All a continuation. Exactly. And it's the same thing uh, there is that he, he addressed them and then he, he goes aside to his disciples, but they're still around. They're in earshot. They can hear this. So, uh, but no, absolutely. Absolutely. Great, great look. And uh, definitely appreciate your comments. Definitely appreciate your comments. So we are, we, we are, walking about in the midst of a watching world yes. Yes. is something that I, I think we ought to take away from this is that this isn't just the uh, internal family conversation but understand that there is the, the, the world is paying attention to how we uh, believe and how we behave and they're looking to see if our behavior matches up with our belief yes, sir. Yes, sir. absolutely yes. Absolutely. So I, I pray that we would all be good stewards, um, and especially in the midst of a watching world, that by uh, someone seeing our example, that they would then be pointed to Christ, who is our ultimate example. Amen. 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 Well, if there's, if there's nothing else, we'll conclude our, our Sunday school lesson. Pastor, anything? Close us out? Okay. All right, very good. Um, just because we have uh, different, you know, technology running right now, I'll go ahead and um, and uh, pray us for pray us out for dismissal. Amen. 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 So, um, eternal God, we ask that uh, you would uh, give us listening ears and tender hearts, dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen. 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 Amen.